Here in America, the term station wagon is very much a dirty word. What started out as the family vehicle of choice from the 1950s to the 1970s quickly developed a bad stigma in the late 80s when sport utility vehicles came onto the scene. Now, one manufacturer has been able to buck the trend of Americans avoiding wagons, and that's Subaru. When the company introduced the all-new Legacy Outback back in 1995, it was designed to give a cash-starved Subaru an entry into the then-emerging sport utility segment. And at the time, Subaru very much didn't have the funds to develop an all-new platform, which is why they took the Legacy wagon, jacked it up a couple of inches, added some cladding, and added the rugged image that Subarus have become known for today. Now, what started out as a science experiment quickly became the saving grace for Subaru, and the company has managed to sell nearly 200,000 Outbacks in the States over the last decade. So moving into 2020, if you guys are looking to buy a new station wagon that's a non-luxury brand, the Outback is the only player in town. And today, it's now in its sixth generation. Subaru has moved it to its global product architecture. And just like the first generation about 25 years ago, it's still based off of the legacy sedan with additional ground clearance, some cladding. In fact, Subaru doesn't even call it a wagon. They want you to call it a sport utility vehicle. And so today's video, I wanna go over some of the reasons why the Subaru Outback continues to be the best-selling and only non-luxury station wagon in America. So to understand why the Subaru Outback is the only successful non-luxury station wagon here in America that actually does well sales-wise, we need to go back in time and talk a little bit about the history of this model. Subaru introduced the Legacy Outback in America back in 1995. Now back then, 25 years ago, if you could believe it, that was the SUV boom here in the States. Of course, the Ford Explorer was doing really well, the Toyota Foreigner was doing well, the Chevrolet Blazer was doing well, and Subaru was starved, a cash-starved Subaru was starved starved for a sport utility vehicle because they just didn't have one in their lineup and they also didn't have the funds to actually go out and develop one from the ground up. So what they essentially did is they took the first generation Legacy at the time, uh, they took the Legacy station wagon, they jacked it up, they added some cladding, they made it look a little bit more rugged, a little bit more adventurous, and then boom, the Legacy Outback was born. Now the first generation Outback was based off of the second generation Legacy, because remember the Legacy had been around in America since 1989, and when the second generation model came out, it was the basis for the uh, Outback version, and it became an instant success for Subaru. Sales instantly took off, and the company moved, I think about, it was around 20,000 units in the first year of sales, which is a really good amount of vehicles for something that Subaru really didn't spend a lot of time actually developing. Now, of course, the first generation Outback was essentially just a jacked up legacy station wagon as it was uh, before. It is still today. It came standard with a 2.2 liter EJ22 uh, four-cylinder engine that had about 130 horsepower. That's right. Back in 1995, the Legacy only had about 130 horsepower. It also really didn't have that much more ground clearance. And if you can believe it, Subaru actually didn't make all-wheel drive standard back then until about 1996. All-wheel drive is such a popular option in 95 that Subaru finally made it standard in 96. It essentially gave Subaru the cash they needed in sales to actually develop the first generation Forester, which came out back in 1997. This was the first ever vehicle that was designed to be a sport utility vehicle from the ground up from Subaru. And of course, back then, the Outback and the Forester became the company's top selling models. Moving on to the second generation Outback. This was introduced back in the year 2000. And this is the one that I remember the most in high school because this is a car that did extremely well for Subaru because the company essentially took the success they had from the first generation, which was just an experiment, and kind of went with it. They really improved a lot of aspects of the next generation Outback. It got a six cylinder engine as, option, as an option, which really improved the horsepower. The 2.5 liter EJ25 became the standard motor. Of course, that car made about 165 horsepower back then, or you could get a little over 200 when you guys had the uh, horizontal six, the three liter motor, and the look of the car just looked a lot more rugged. They really changed the overall appearance. You could also get the Outback in sedan form in terms of the uh, station wagon and the sedan. Basically, the sedan looked a little bit strange because it actually had the same raised up ground clearance as the uh, wagon version which made it look a little bit odd. But again, Subarus were known for being rugged, for being quirky vehicles, and uh, for having, of course, the signature uh, boxer engine. It's what gave the cars their signature overall driving experience. The second generation Outback was also the basis of the Subaru Baja, which is a car truck that still is actually in a really high demand today because it was a car that you could get with a manual transmission and a turbocharged engine. You could essentially get the 2.5 liter turbo from the WRX in that car, just kind of detuned to make less power. 
But regardless, it was a very unique vehicle because it offered you know, a pickup truck form, but with also the car-like driving dynamics that we expect from the Outback. Ground clearance back then was also set around 7.3 inches, so still not the full 8.7 that you get today, but it was a huge success for Subaru and sales started to approach 100,000 units uh, for this generation model before it was replaced with a third generation version in 2005. Now, when the third generation Outback came out in 2005, this is actually the one that I prefer the most because it was the, a time where Subaru really injected a healthy dose of sport into the Outback and legacy family. This is a car that offered a choice between the base 2.5 liter EJ25 motor. You could also get the three liter horizontal six, which had a little bit more power. And Subaru also introduced the GT version of the legacy where you can get a turbocharged version. The Outback was called the XT. It was the same 2.5 liter turbo that was essentially in the Subaru W. It made essentially the same horsepower as the Horizontal 6, but you got more torque and you also had the tuning aspect because um, of the car's you know, WRX heritage. Now, those models were distinguished with a hood scoop, a functional hood scoop, and it was essentially the last year, the only generation at the time that you can get with a turbocharged engine. Now, Subaru, again, kind of increased the sporty factor of the Legacy and Outback during this generation because they offered the GT in a unique spec B form, which is essentially just kind of like a grown up version of a WRX STI. It had a detuned version of that car. It came with a six speed manual transmission. It had a stiffened lower suspension. It was a very much a limited production car that is still worth a lot of money today if you could find one that is in a very low mileage condition. In terms of the Outback and its ruggedness, Subaru kind of made it a little bit more rugged. This is where they increased the ground clearance of the car to a little over eight inches to again, improve the off-road capability of this vehicle. And at the under end of the spectrum, they also improved the sportiness. On the interior, they tried to make it a little bit more luxurious. They made the exterior styling also a little bit more sleek. This car had lines that reminded me a little bit of a Saab and a Volvo at times. It was a car that actually still looks good today. If you could find a really clean, you know, legacy or Outback example from this generation, they still look really good today, especially if you find one with the turbocharged engine with the functional hood scoop. It was really a defining character of this generation was being able to get one with the turbocharged engine. Now in 2010, Subaru replaced the Outback again with the all new fourth generation model. Now remember, the Legacy was in its fifth generation, but the Outback was a year behind in terms of the generation. So this was the all new fourth generation. And this is the model that I essentially deemed to be my least favorite because Subaru basically took all the sleekness that we liked about the third generation model and added a little bit of frumpiness to the design. It just kind of at times looked like a mismatch of other vehicles uh, in its styling. It kind of had some weird Mitsubishi lines. It just didn't look really as sleek as the previous generation. And of course, Subaru also took away some of the sporty factor when they introduced this model. It was the first Subaru product to get their linear Tronic CVT transmission, at least in the Outback family. Um, it was paired up with the four cylinder engine, which still continued to be the 2.5 liter EJ25 motor. The three liter uh, horizontal six was enlarged to, of course, to 3.6 liters to increase the horsepower and torque. Subaru dropped the turbocharged engine for this generation in, in the effort to make the Outback more fuel efficient and more refined. It's one of the reasons why they replaced the antiquated four speed automatic from the previous generation, replaced it with the Linear Tronic CVT. If you guys went for the Horizontal 6, the 3.6 liter R versions, those actually came with a five speed automatic, which came from the Subaru B9 Tribeca or just the Subaru Tribeca, depending on you know if you guys are referring to the refresh model or not. In total, Subaru sales continued to expand for the Outback. The interior was made a little bit roomier. This generation got bigger, larger, heavier, more refined. Subaru again was trying to make the car more refined in order to pull in more of those luxury buyers. Because you know, wagons in America typically don't do well unless you're a luxury player. However, the Subaru Outback kind of bucked that trend because of its own unique quirkiness, its own unique design, its rugged capability. And Subaru was very much capitalizing on that. But I think with the fourth generation model, they lost a lot of that sporty edge that was really starting to draw in enthusiasts, uh, which for me makes it my least favorite of all the Outback versions. Finally, in 2015, Subaru introduced the all new fifth generation Outback. And if you guys look at the design of this one, it was a huge improvement over the fourth generation model, at least in my opinion. This is a car that uh, was the first Outback to come equipped with the EyeSight, Subaru EyeSight safety system, which Subaru did offer it in 2013 when they refreshed the previous gen, but you could only get it on the higher trims. This is when Subaru started to expand the availability of EyeSight. Remember, this is a technology that was very much new and Subaru was touting it up as being a driver assistance tech that really was rivaling a lot of the luxury players uh, for its time, considering it had the fact that it had the two cameras mounted up at the high end of the windshield. Now, this generation model also continued to offer uh, a 2.5 liter four cylinder engine, but it did have a new 2.5 liter. The EJ was replaced 
back in 2013 with of course the FB motor, which is the same one they're still using today. It now makes 170 horsepower for this generation. The 3.6 R models continue to use the same engine, but they've been refined to make around 256 horsepower. And this Outback essentially was one of the most luxurious and the most comfortable Outbacks while preserving the rugged nature of the vehicle, of course, with its 8.7 inches of ground clearance, its standard Subaru symmetrical all-wheel drive. This, this generation also has really started to throw in a lot of the technology. So you could start seeing Android Auto and Apple CarPlay introduced. That was late in the generation back in 2018. And sales essentially took off. This is when the Outback became Subaru's best-selling model with sales approaching 190,000 units every year. So obviously Subaru was doing something right. A lot of other manufacturers tried to come in and introduce their own version of wagons. Of course, Volkswagen has the Jetta all-track or the Golf you know, all-track or uh, sport wagon. And then of course, uh, Buick tried to come in with the Regal Tour X, which I actually drove that car uh, a couple of years ago. I find a lot that I liked about it but it also didn't have the same kind of rugged capability because Subaru, as you guys know, owners are very much loyal to this brand because of the fact that, you know, they promote their rugged image, which again, makes the car more appealing to people who really like to do a lot of outdoor activities. So here we are now at the all new 2020 Subaru Outback. Remember, this is now in its sixth generation. And this car, even though it may not look all new, is based off of the Subaru Global Platform. So the same one that underpins the Ascent, the Impreza, of course, the Crosstrek. And this is a car that's super important to Subaru because with sales approaching 200,000 units every year here in the States, the company didn't want to take too many chances with this car in terms of appealing to the Subaru loyalist. Now, of course, underneath the hood of this vehicle, we see the return of the Outback XT. That's right, a turbo engine is back, although there is no more functional hood scoop. So we were says that the hood scoop would have interfered too much with the EyeSight, which by the way, the EyeSight driver assistance tech on this car is now standard equipment on even the base versions of this car. It has a completely new interior, which is much more luxurious. It offers up to 11.6 inch touchscreen infotainment system. As you can see the design, Subaru says that they tried to make it look like an off-road shoe or like an outdoor shoe with the cladding. I originally did not like the cladding on this car. It's grown on me a little bit, but it doesn't really do it any favors painted in this shade of cinnamon brown metallic, which to me just kind of looks like doo-doo brown. It's not my favorite color. It offers up to 260 horsepower, of course, with this turbo model and full LED headlights or standard equipment. Subaru in the past typically makes you pay extra for the LED headlights, so it's nice to see the company you know, throwing that in on all the lower trims, even with the baser models. Now, of course, this one here is an XT Touring. It's the top of the line version at a sticker price of around $40,000. It makes an enticing, you know, option compared to something like a Honda CRV or a Toyota RAV4. It's very much still a midsize uh, station wagon or crossover vehicle at 191 inches long. Subaru essentially made this car about an inch and a half longer and a half inch wider to give this car more interior space. On the inside, Subaru basically says you have more back backseat legroom at 38 inches and you have slightly more cargo space. At the rear of the car, as you can see, the design is very much an evolutionary take. You've got these LED accented taillights, more of that cladding, which is trying to resemble a hiking boot per se. But overall, let me know in the comments below which generation is your favorite. I personally still think the third generation is my favorite for its sporty pretensions, but this one here definitely has all the tech features and with that turbocharged engine, it makes it an enticing engine option to a lot of the uh, compact crossovers out there. So another reason why the Subaru Outback is one of the best-selling wagons in America is because it's also also a very unique wagon in the sense that you can essentially buy one off of the factory showroom floor and take it into an off-road condition that is meant for ATVs, which is the park that I'm at today, just outside of Luray, Virginia. Uh, we're over here at the Tas the Peter Mill Run or Tas Tasker's Gap off-road trail. And this is a trail that I've taken a lot of Jeeps to, a lot of Land Rovers to, some Tacomas and Forerunners. You typically don't see car-based SUVs here, although they can get through. And again, I'm not even driving an SUV, it's a wagon. But with 8.7 inches of ground clearance, I've been driving on this trail for the last couple of hours. And I have to say, the car has not scraped once. It's still on the factory Yokohama tires, which are a street tire. Although I would feel better if um, I swapped out these tires and put some all-terrain tires on it, just so it had a little more cushion. But again, the Outback kind of gets right through it super easily. I haven't even had to turn on X mode yet. The all-wheel drive system, the symmetrical all-wheel drive system just kind of gets it through. There's plenty of power from the 2.4 liter engine. And also what makes the Outback super unique is the fact that it's not super wide like some SUVs. So, you know, going through a trail like this where there are some narrow portions of it, I, you know, in a big SUV like a Range Rover, for example, I'd have to squeeze my way through. Whereas the Outback, it's, it's pretty small and narrow. So it kind of gets through pretty easily. The overall length and size of this vehicle is really perfect for, you know, these types of conditions. And you 
better be believe that a lot of Subaru owners actually do take their Outback or their vehicles into conditions like this. Now, they're not gonna be obviously places where a rock crawling Jeep is gonna go through with like a 11 or 12 inch lift on it, but for something that's straight out of the factory floor, this is extremely capable. It's more capable than it really needs to be. I mean, I've driven the Regal Tour X, which had, uh, Buick said it had like a couple more inches of ground clearance, but when I took it through conditions like this, it really scraped a lot. Um, the Golf All Track, which isn't on sale anymore because it's being it's been discontinued since the new generation is coming out, still does not have the level of ground clearance that the Outback has. Really, there's just a, a level of ruggedness that Subaru promises and it's the reason why people love these vehicles. I mean, if you guys need to go practically anywhere that's not, you know, a crazy rock trail that a lifted Jeep's gonna go to, this vehicle is essentially gonna take you there. And when you get off the trail, it's going to remain comfortable. It's gonna get to good gas mileage. And as you can see, the suspension really soaks up the bumps here of this bumpy, rocky terrain to the point where I really feel super confident going through areas like this in the Outback. And I really wouldn't get this feeling in any other wagon. I mean, sure you can compare it to the Volvo X or V60 cross country, which I haven't driven the cross country version yet, but it still doesn't have the kind of, quiet, the kind of ground clearance or capability that Subaru promises with the Outback. So now that we've talked about the different generations of the Outback, I had this opportunity to actually show you guys the differences with the two vehicles parked next to each other. Now remember, this sixth generation of the Outback came out this year, and it was new at the same time as the all new Legacy. Now, of course, those of you who owned the previous generation, you might be happy that Subaru barely made any changes to this generation. It's kind of a very evolutionary change in terms of the design, even though these are riding on completely new platforms. Now seeing the vehicles side by side, you're obviously gonna notice quite a few things beside the fact that one of them is a station wagon and one of them is a traditional uh, three box sedan. Subaru actually made these cars longer for this all new six generation model. At 191 inches long for the Outback, this is about an inch longer versus the Legacy. So not that much longer in terms of the overall length, but Subaru, to make this thing more like a crossover, made the Outback actually six inches taller. So of course you're gonna see that height in the actual roof line and these uh, roof rails that you get that stand around the vehicle and in terms of the ground clearance. This car has around 8.7 inches of ground clearance, which is actually more ground clearance than what you're gonna get in some of the competing midsize SUVs like the Ford Edge or the Honda Passport. The wheel and tire size, as you can see also, Subaru gave the Outback a slightly meatier tire with more sidewall protection because they actually market this thing as an SUV. You can take this car off road, this wagon off-road, which makes it one of the few wagons that actually has some genuine off-road capability. Now, of course, coming at the rear of the vehicles, you can see one of them is a traditional sedan. And one of the reasons why the Legacy sells very little, Subaru only sold about 35,000 Legacies for all of 2019. It's simply because, you know, compared to the trunk space, this is decent for a sedan. However, a lot of buyers look at the space of the Outback, which by the way, it comes with a power tailgate, and you get literally 35 cubic feet of space. So 20 more with the seats up, fold everything down and you get 75 cubic feet of space. This is more than what you're gonna find in all of those compact SUVs and approaching what you get in those mid-size SUVs. So really in terms of the overall practicality, it's really easy to see why Subaru sells about 180,000 of these versus only 35,000 of these. So what makes the Subaru Outback so popular? Well, for one thing, the technology in this car is definitely way up there in terms of the competition. As I got into this car, the driver focus that Subaru puts on the touring trim actually scans your face and tells you that it recognizes you. So again, if you've got to share this car with your spouse or significant other, um, it will basically know who is driving the car as soon as you step into the vehicle and it'll automatically change your presets for the seats, for the mirror, even for your phone, for the music and stuff like that. It'll switch it to that as you get into the car. So that's a really great piece of technology. And Subaru has finally caught up there because it used to be very behind in terms of the infotainment, in terms of the safety tech. And that's simply not the case anymore with any Subaru product. Now, going for a drive, let's start in the Outback because obviously this video is talking about the Outback in general and why it's such a strong selling car. Now, I called it a car because when I look at this thing and I drive it, it feels like I'm driving a car in terms of the size of this thing. Uh, the Outback in general feels very, very um, compact, yet it's a lot longer than most of the compact SUVs out there, which makes this thing a really interesting alternative because it's not quite as wide as those vehicles, yet it offers the same kind of ground clearance. So even though you know I'm driving this thing down the road and it feels like I'm driving just a regular ordinary car, it has a very comfortable ride. You sit up higher like you're in an SUV, 
but you don't have this massively wide, you know, fat vehicle that a lot of SUVs can kind of give you that sensation. And it makes people much more comfortable when they're driving the Outback because it's just a really easy car to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. And just because the Outback is considered more of a family car does not mean you don't get to have a little bit of fun when you're behind the wheel. Uh, this particular one here is the 2.4 liter turbocharged engine. So it's the XT Touring trim with 260 horsepower and 277 pound-feet of torque paired with a linear Tronic CVT. I know CVTs are not the preferred transmission choice for a lot of enthusiasts. However, Subaru has been doing a CVT for about the, t the last decade or so. And their CVT is their own design. It has nothing to do with the Jatco transmission that Nissan uses in their CVTs. And it's just a very good transmission for this particular car. The turbo engine has a lot of mid-range torque, very little turbo lag. It puts the engine right in the meat of its power band, whenever you put your foot down. And you can get to 60 in around 6.2 seconds with the turbo model Outback, despite the fact that this car weighs, you know, right around uh, 40 or 3,900 pounds. Now, a car-like driving position and demeanor is very important for a lot of SUV, SUV buyers. In fact, most SUVs nowadays drive a lot like cars. However, when you get into the Outback, it's an interesting mix of, of you know, SUV and car because it gives you that higher seating position that a lot of people like in an SUV, but it also feels like you're just driving a car. I, I, you never really can explain the sensation until you actually drive one of these things. I mean, sure, there's a lot of other lifted station wagons out there, but none of them really have the same kind of, you know, off the road feel or up in the uh, uh, high off the ground feel that the Outback gives you. And it's what makes this thing pretty unique in the segment. Uh, I think that's one of the keys to success for this vehicle because you sit up nice and high, the seats are comfortable, it's quiet in here, Subaru has thrown in a lot of technology, it has plenty of power when you guys go for the 2.4 liter turbo engine. You have all the driver assistance, you guys heard a couple of beeps, that's the Subaru iSci. That same driver focus is actually watching your face and if you're not paying attention to the road, it'll actually beep at you and scan to keep your eyes on the road or it'll tell you that in a warning message. So some of the technology can be a little annoying but some of it is very helpful, like when you share this car with your significant other because full disclosure, I actually bought this car for my spouse because we have a new six month old puppy at home. And Subaru again likes to advertise this car as a very adventure seeking, you know, pet friendly kind of vehicle. And that is truly the case because the Outback isn't quite as tall or as cumbersome to drive as some of those SUVs, but it gives you more cargo space than a lot of those compact and even approaches the midsize SUVs without the, the feeling of bulk or the fuel consumption thirst. Now we've only actually had this car for about a week now and put about 470 miles on in the last week and a half. Uh, and actually we've been averaging around uh, 23 MPG. Now again, the car is still very new. It's still breaking in. This car is rated to get around 23 in the city, 30 on the highway. It has about an 18 and a half gallon gas tank. Full tank, we've seen about 350 miles of range. We, I'm expecting that number to go up uh, because you know, as you guys, or as you drive the car, it breaks in a little bit more. But that's pretty excellent fuel consumption, especially considering how quick this car is with the turbo engine. Now, Again, the Outback is no sports sedan. That's not its mission. But at the same time, I'm kind of okay with that because as a comfortable commuter car, you know, that's supposed to hold, you know, your family, hold all your stuff, the Outback very much excels at that. And it comes with the promise of Subaru reliability and build quality and dependability. As you guys know, Subaru has a reputation for build quality. And you see a lot of those old Outbacks out on the road or any, at least any old Subaru in general. So for comparison purposes, I've switched from the Outback into the Legacy. Now remember, Subaru only sold about 35,000 Legacies compared to nearly 200,000 Outbacks. So that is simply very strange in the US because typically if there is a sedan and a wagon version, the sedan will outsell it in the numbers of the Outback versus the wagon having the smaller numbers of the Legacy. However, Subaru is the only one which does bring up an interesting point because Hopping into the two cars back to back, this one here is slightly different because this is the one that has the 2.5 liter naturally aspirated engine. It's a limited trim, not quite as expensive as the Touring that I just got out of, um, but the Outback kind of had a special feel to it. 
it made you, you know, you sat up higher, but you could also feel that you were driving around in a car that felt like it was just sitting up a little bit higher. It was very comfortable. The Legacy, on the, on the other hand, you definitely notice you sit about three inches lower in the Legacy. You have the same kind of view out of the front, out of the side mirrors. It also feels pretty small and very narrow. The, the Legacy platform in general is much more narrow than most of the competition. It's very good visibility, just like the Outback. But there's a certain sense in here that I'm driving a car that is less cool, that is less special feeling. And that's kind of the, the way the Outback feels because everybody in America likes to sit up high, at least everyone in general nowadays likes to sit up high. And the Outback gives you that while the Legacy doesn't. It just feels like a regular sedan. On the outside, the Legacy also looks a little bit boring. I think Subaru played it a little too safe with the design of this car, even though it's based off of the same design as the Outback, obviously, same platform. But the problem with this car is sedans nowadays have significantly changed. Buyer demands for sedans have significantly changed. So when you think of a sedan, you want it to deliver something that an SUV can't deliver, and that's sportier driving dynamics, sexier styling, and unfortunately, the Legacy has neither of those, especially when you guys go for the base engine. For example, there's no sport mode anywhere. When you put your foot down, the CVT is very responsive, and the engine actually, for a base engine, has decent acceleration, but the turbo is the way you're gonna to wanna to go you know, if you're gonna buy this car. Now, when I first drove the Legacy at the Media Drive last year, I tried to, I was thinking it could be Subaru had made the car a little bit more like a, you know, a Subaru, a grown up Subaru WRX, but that sadly is not the case. And it's definitely not the case when you guys go for the base engine of this car. I think the problem with the Legacy and why it doesn't outsell or it doesn't sell more is because it is just a rather boring drab car that Subaru should have added more pizzazz to. Now, of course, nobody likes a CVT that's droney, and Subaru's Linear Tronic CVT is one of the better ones in the business. Um, it also makes some fake shifts. It has some preset ratios, so I can use these little paddles here. It gives me eight virtual ratios, which it's honestly not bad, but remember, Subarus are not supposed to be the sportiest cars to drive, at least not the Legacy and Outback uh, when you guys drive these, but I think the problem with the Legacy is the fact that Subaru didn't make this car sportier. They should have brought back a Legacy GT, made this car a little bit sharper looking on the outside. Because really, with the all-wheel drive Camry in the lineup and the all-wheel drive Altima, there's very little reason to get the Legacy, so I don't expect this car to get any better in terms of sales, unless Subaru decides to add a little bit more sex appeal to this sedan. I mean, come on, Subaru, would it kill you to add a little bit more sex appeal to the Legacy? But pretty much driving the two cars back to back, it's pretty easy to see why the Outback outsells the Legacy. Because when you drive the when you drive the two back to back for not much more money, you get a much more comfortable, you know, car. You get more off road capability. You get way more practicality, uh, and you also get a really unique car. I mean, a lifted station wagon in a world full of F SUVs. It's easy to see why the Outback is so appealing to a lot of people. So with increased off-road capability, additional cargo space, and more interior room versus the Legacy sedan, on paper, it's pretty easy to see why the Outback is the obviously better choice for American families. However, numbers on paper only show a few things. And when you start comparing the two vehicles in the real world, it's pretty easy to see why the Outback continues to have so much success here in America. Unlike a lot of the other competitors like a Toyota Camry, a Honda Accord, a Mazda 6, a Nissan Altima, Subaru has built a long reputation for themselves for being a outdoorsy kind of rugged, adventurous style brand. And I think that's the reason why the Outback continues to have success. If you look at the segment as a whole, there are no non-luxury wagons available. Other manufacturers have tried, such as Buick, Ford, Ford, Honda, even Toyota. However, those brands all had to pull out of the wagon segment because nobody bought those vehicles simply because they just don't have the same kind of reputation that Subaru has. The Outback in general competes in this really interesting white space because you can essentially compare this car to something like a Honda CRV or Toyota RAV4. It's priced within those same categories, but it has the interior space of a midsize SUV like the Honda Passport, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, and the Ford Edge. Now that's the beauty about the Outback because at a starting price of around $26,000, which is about $4,000 more than that Legacy, this does make the Outback a very enticing proposition. Even this fully loaded XT Touring that I'm showing you here, at $41,000 for everything, this is essentially priced in the same category as something like the CRV Touring or a 
a Toyota RAV4 Limited. However, what it gives you is that cool wagon swag, because unlike wagons that you saw back in the 1990s and 80s with their hideous wood paneling, this to me definitely has a new kind of coolish look to it, even though it doesn't kind of have the same kind of amazing factor that you get from like a Mercedes AMG E63 wagon or the upcoming Audi RS6 Avant. Really, the fact that the Outback, with its off-road capability, with its interior room, with that new tech that they now offer on this all-new sixth-generation model, it's going to continue to make the Outback the best-selling model. And I wouldn't be surprised to see Subaru surpass 200,000 sales for the 2020 model year. So what started out as just a legacy wagon with additional ground clearance and some cladding has quickly evolved to become this cool niche vehicle for Subaru. And I honestly don't think any other manufacturer will be able to replicate that car. Other brands have tried, as I said before. However, Subaru has really carved out an impressive niche because as you guys know, Subaru buyers are some of the most loyal buyers, buyers in the industry. People who buy an Outback will just end up replacing it with another one, which is probably why Subaru went super conservative with the all new sixth generation model when they introduced this in 2020. But with all that said, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video talking about why the Subaru Outback continues to be the best selling station wagon in America. If you guys are also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews, like us on Facebook, and as always guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching guys. I'll catch you all in the next video.